So, welcome back to Silmarillion Total War, and it's been a little while since I've shown this off, but um, I didn't want to show just anything for Silmarillion off, because it's quite a... It's, it's a long way behind Reforged and its development journey, of course, because it started development quite a long time afterwards. Um, it does have a few advantages, like it can use... Re well, it has used Reforged, essentially, as a base, so they couldn't, didn't have to start completely from scratch, but even so, uh, there's still a lot to do to give Silmarillion its own identity, and it does have that, uh, but of course, it's still... Uh, it's still uh, further away from completion than Reforged, naturally. Um, but, even so, progress has been made, and I think just like how Reforged has managed to gain its ability to add custom scenarios and battles back in with the advent of its hotfix, um, it seems as though there are a few more custom scenarios uh, going through the pipeline for Silmarillion, which I think can only be a good thing, uh, because I think certainly from the perspective of me showing battles off on, uh, on YouTube, custom scenarios are probably the best way to do that, um, certainly to uh, give people an idea of where Silmarillion is in its particular development journey, and this is going to be good. Um, this battle is also the Dagor Bragolak, which is actually a battle that I've shown previously on the channel, albeit maybe not in quite the same context as this, because it was using, of course, the uh, the Third Age uh, factions rather than the uh, the First Age ones that we can see here, which would, of course, be more lore-friendly. And essentially, the story behind this one is that uh, just after Morgoth broke the siege of Angband, um, he then gained entry into Beleriand with fire and blood. Um, and that is going to be the set piece here, so the orcs are going to be falling upon this defensive line, uh, and if all goes as it did in the lore, um, the orcs uh, would go on to win this, but of course uh, that may not be the case, uh, we may see a revisionist history uh, happen this time of course, because it is easier said than done to break down a well-prepared defence, especially when you have uh, such strong elves on the defence. Um, and nonetheless, we shall start off with the Orcs, and Jay Monster is the one who sent me this battle replay, and this was a battle I actually wanted to be a part of, but I was busy downloading the patch and actually extracting it and trying to overwrite the version of the game that I had, which is always a painful process with Medieval 2 mods because of the amount of files involved, it takes a long time, um, so unfortunately I missed the start of the battle, but hopefully um, uh, more will follow and hopefully I can actually be a part of those. Um, but Jay Monster is going to be heading up the forces of Morgoth. The realm of Angband is going to be uh, trying to get across that river and into Beleriand itself. Um, he's got some Guardians of the Iron Crown here on the front line, which... is that right? I thought those were Iron Shard Ravagers... apparently not. Guardians of the Iron Crown. Interesting. Uh, they've probably had their uh, unit model change, so obviously we've got some lower tier shock infantry here. Um, the armor piercing should still be quite useful because several of the elven factions do uh, pack on that heavy armor and of course, generally speaking, uh, the Orcish Shock Infantry is where you're going to be get dealing most of your damage. Um, a lot of the Orcish Line Infantry is just there to stand and try and not die for as long as possible. Uh, that's true in Silmarillion just as it is in any of the other Reefor or Third Age variants, I should say. Um, and the Guardians of the Iron Crown will be on the front from there. Uh, just in behind, however, we have the start of the heart and soul of the Angband roster, which is the Iron Shod unit, starting off with the Iron Shod Reavers. So you can see there that they've got the sort of halberd heads in one hand, and the blackened shields and blackened plate armour um, also covering them as well. Um, so this is going to be sort of the more aggressive variant of Angband's line infantry, which uh, should be quite useful as well, because of course Angband is going to have a pretty hefty numbers advantage here. Um, so the more damage you can do, the faster that you can uh, start peeling away at that elven manpower, the better it's going to be for you, and the Reavers will probably be slightly better at that than something like the Legionaries, but I'm sure we'll see the Ironshot Legionaries as well. That is a big line of Ironshot Reavers. Speaking of which, the Ironshot Legionnaires are just in behind them, so this is the sword-wielding variant. Uh, a little bit better at standing up to punishment in melee, so they won't be slaughtered by the elves in quite the same way, but they still, of course, will find themselves um, outgunned in that respect. Once again, it's going to be their numbers, which makes them a uh, scary opponent to face for the defenders on this occasion. Uh, but good armour. You know, that is the thing with Angband in comparison to the uh, Dominion of Tol and Guahos, which is the other orc faction headed up by Sauron. Uh, the Realm of Angband do have much better armour. Um, so they are going to be quite resilient to the elven missiles that are inevitably going to be coming their way, um, but even so. Um, that is going to be something else which they have in their locker. Ironshot Arbalists, so crossbowmen, we all know how powerful crossbowmen are in any Medieval 2 variant. They are going to need to get into a good position to fire, which is going to be easier said than done once again, because getting into a good position on the riverbank, especially when you're the ones that have to attack into a well-prepared defence, a unit like this is going to be fairly likely to be focused down, and while they do still have uh, the nice armour that the Iron Shod units uh, can fall back upon, they don't have the shields in the same way that quite a lot of the Iron Shots do, so they are going to have to be careful from that perspective. Over here on this side, we have the Spear Guard of the Iron Crown. 
Um, and that's the thing which, which confuses me somewhat. Like, it says these are Guardians of the Iron Crown. I thought the Guardians of the Iron Crown were um, a unit which had this look to them, only a big shield and a mace, not something that looked like the Orc Maulers. I wonder if that's an oversight in some of the work they've done recently. I could be wrong, but Spear Guard of the Iron Crown, regardless, really heavy spearmen uh, for the um, Orcs, of course. So, again, very good on the defence, very good at forming a bit of an anchor on the front line. They're going to be very resilient to the Elven Arrows. They're going to be quite difficult to kill as well quickly, um, but ultimately they're not really here to do damage all that fast either. So it's going to be sort of a nice, hard centre to the Orcish line, um, and that's going to be uh, what they have to do. We have the Bulldogs of Angband, so of course these guys obviously with their Jack Black armour. This is actually only a placeholder model, because previously the old Bulldogs model, which had of course the severed heads on stakes in behind them on their armour, um, was causing a few uh, stability issues, so they have been temporarily removed uh, while they look for a fix for that. So for the time being, the Bulldogs look like this. Very, very scary unit of Orc infantry though, and that is one of the things with Angband, in a very similar way to how Mordor, who are kind of a pale imitation of what Angband are really, um, in the future, you know, their focuses are, a split between high tier stuff and then all of their basic stuff, and the Bulldogs definitely count as one of the high tier scary units of Angband. Thralls of Angband, which are low tier archers, Low tier archers, of course, are always going to be good for the orcs on the attack against the elves because they can be thrown forward with reckless abandon and the elves need to respond to them in some way and you don't really want to be wasting your ammunition on a unit like this if you have a choice in the matter. Uh, J-Monster also has, I think, those are two units of Uraloki he has available to him. So the Uraloki, of course, if you have a look close to them, sort of these Hydra-looking guys and they have the, uh, the Fiery Breath. Um, it's not as d devastating as the Witcher's Fiery Breath from Reforged, it's, uh, it's, it must be said. Um, and also, armoured units can resist it very well. It's only really devastating against lightly armoured targets, so you do need to pick and choose your targets quite carefully if you're going to use the Uraloki. Um, they're also pretty good in melee though, obviously, when you look at them, they're obviously Juggernauts as well. Um, so if they're used well, um, it's going to be difficult for the Elves to... Uh, to come back from the losses that they take at the hands of the Uraloki, but of course not impossible. The elves have their own tools for dealing with such things. More spear guard over on this side, and then finally we have some wolf riders of Angban. So it is once again the um, well, they're actually riding Karagors rather than wolves. Um, but once again, uh, the Dominion of Tol and Guahoth are the ones who focus more so on their war cavalry than uh, Angban. But Angban do now have a cavalry option that they can use as well. So if the if the defenders do decide to sally out. Um, Angband do have a ready-made uh, response to that. King of Isengard Artorias playing as the second Angband army. We'll go through this one slightly faster until we come across some new units. Speaking of which, the Wretches of Angband, pretty much the closest analogous to Orc Fodder in Silmarillion. Uh, so they, of course, are the, the lowest of the low when it comes to Angband's units. Very much sacrificial lambs for some of the better units, but as we've seen several times in the past, units like this most certainly have their place if they're used correctly. Just in behind, we have the Iron Shod Ravagers, so this is the heavily armoured shock troops. Uh, that, uh, that Angband have available to them, heavily armoured, relatively speaking, of course, for Orcs. And once again, uh, this is going to come down to decent damage, you know, the armour piercing is going to be better against some units than others on the defence. Um, time will tell how well they can be used, because of course they will be uh, almost certainly one of the units which is going to be focused down on the approach if they're not careful. We have the Balrogs here, uh, which is where the General's going to be hanging out. The Balrogs, of course, are basically trolls on steroids, mechanically speaking. Uh, if they are committed at the right time, they will wreak havoc. If they are committed at the wrong time, however, without any support, they can be singled out and overwhelmed. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see how Angband and Artorias decide to commit them. Iron Shot Ravages, I'm 99% I'm sure at this point the Guardians of the Iron Crown should not be looking like this. Um, because it also stands apart from most of the unit models that we could see in Angband. They sort of stand out a little bit. Regardless, Guardians of the Iron Crown. Wretches of Angband, Iron Shot Ravagers, more Wretches, Iron Shot Arbalists, Reavers, we've seen those, Iron Shot Halberdiers as well, so a nice Phalanx unit um, that Angband have available to them, Halberdiers, Pikemen are much rarer in Silmarillion as it stands, um, Halberdiers are still here, so I mean Halberds can be a really useful tool on the front line, Armour Piercing once again, nice Phalanx, um, but again they're likely to be focused down on the approach, more Iron Shot Halberdiers, a full line of Iron Shot Halberdiers in fact for Artorias. More Iron Shot Arbalists, Legionnaires, Legionnaires, Wretches of Angband. There is also the Troll Guard of Gothmog. So Gothmog, I think, was actually the commander of this particular battle for Morgoth, I believe. So uh, we got the Troll Guard here. 
they are not as powerful as the Balrogs, of course, um, but they're not too far behind, and they are another example of the monstrous units that Angband have available to them. So Balrogs, Uraloki, Trollguard of Gothmog, um, the Bulldogs of Angband to a certain extent as well. Um, lots of really high tier, scary units in conjunction with the uh, the heavily armoured Ironshot Legions that they have at their disposal as well. And then finally we have Secretariat, Bulldogs, we have Ironshot Legionnaires, we have more Ironshot Legionnaires. I imagine he's got nothing new over here really, because we've already seen most of what Angband has to offer from the other two armies. Spear Guard and Guardians, we have Ironshot Legionnaires, Legionnaires, Wretches, Halberdiers, yeah, it looks like everything pretty much as you'd expect, lots of Wretches. Ironshot Halberdiers, some Thralls of Angband once again for some Missiles, Reavers, more Thralls, more Wretches, and then finally a second unit of Wolf Riders of Angband here at the back. So some Cavalry here, potentially to be used on the open plains away from the river, but now we shall move on to the Defenders, and we shall start off with Stoop, who's going to be playing as the House of Feanor, who have both Human and Elven units at their disposal. Um, their focus is certainly around heavy cavalry, heavy units in general. Uh, their armor values are really very good, especially among their elven units. Shield bearers of Hellevorn as well. The human units offer a little bit more in terms of numbers for Feanor to use, which could be very, very important in this battle, um, because they're going to need every man available to try and stop this uh, brutal orcish advance. Of course, the shield bearers of Hellevorn are spearmen, so they are going to be subject to uh, reduced damage because of their spears against infantry but good at holding the line, reasonably numerous, and as long as they're backed up by the elves, they can make a very fine accompaniment to some of the uh, higher tier units in Feanor's roster. We have the Stalkers of Thargelion, which are javelin units, of course. Javelins are you know, still going to be very, very effective if you can use them in the right place, um, against the orcs especially, because, of course, they're pretty reliant on their armor, so javelin volleys coming in from the side could be pretty brutal and I would imagine that this Feanor army is intended to be a bit of a reinforcement column as the orcs move forward so I wouldn't be too surprised if the orcs don't attack down this direction first of all and Feanor, Feanor's army is only activated later but we shall see. Uh, we got some Huntsmen of Thargelion so some human archers as well, um, obviously nice spears on their back as well so a nice multi-purpose unit here. Uh, at the back we have some Rangers of Halivorn as well, which are essentially another Javelin unit, only even better than the Stalkers. This is a mostly human army, it has to be said. With the exception of the Roqueni Magloro, who are of course heavy elven knights. Uh, the heaviest knights that currently exist in the game as well, a truly terrifying unit. Um, considering the fact that in Silmarillion, when it comes to your, your showstopper units, the very best that you can feel. Generally speaking, other factions won't have an equivalent to that, so really no faction in the game is capable of fielding a unit quite like the Roqueni at the moment, uh, which gives Feanor, especially on an open field like this, a potentially devastating tool, albeit in this situation Angband do have some uh, some wargs, some wolf riders that they can use to try and zone this cavalry out, but um, it will be interesting to see nonetheless. So some elves heading up uh, some of the, uh, the human units here that uh, are going to be coming in from the side. Then we have Gildor, Finrod, Anarchalin, I'm just going to call him Gildor for the remainder of this fight. I think he's going to be playing as the House of Finarfed. House of Finarfed, a little bit more about their spears. Heavy spearmen here, Wardens of Nargothrond, holding on to the front line. Uh, both two units of them. And some defenders of Talath Dirnin. So the Talath Dirnin units, they are the essentially the, the standard units for the House of Finarfed. The uh, Nargothrond units are slightly higher tier, so lots of spears on the front line. Again, spears are a little bit more uh, of a factor in Silmarillion, I have to say. Like a lot of, there's a lot more of a focus on spears as being sort of your all-purpose units, even in spite of the malice. And the House of Finarfin uh, definitely uh, have a, a big focus on their spearmen. Marksmen of Nargothron, so some higher tier, heavier archers here, which are obviously in a good position to shower arrows down upon the orcs as they move forward. Swordsmen of Talath Dirnin, who are javelin line infantry hybrids, which is a a unit type which is always really useful because the javelins are so damaging and then when it comes to uh, mucking in in melee a unit like this is also not defenseless in the same way that uh, some others might be. Over here we have some more marksmen of Nargothrond, so some higher tier units, a lot of Nargothrond units as you'd expect because obviously this is a large assault they're having to try and deal with. More swordsmen of Talath Dirnin with their javelins. Back here we have the bridge wards of Nargothrond which as it stands I believe they are still the only pike unit in the game. Um, and when it comes to holding a choke point like this, pikes can be invaluable, of course, as long as they can avoid uh, getting their formation split by Balrogs or getting shot to pieces by the Ironshot Arbalists. They could be uh, one of the main hopes of the defenders here as they try to hold on to this crossing. And then the Sartor Findorato, which are the essentially the General's Bodyguard tier unit for Finarfin, a really heavy unit of spearmen. Um, so that comes with all the things you'd expect. They're not necessarily the fastest at killing, 
considering the cost of them, considering the relative tier of their unit, but they are incredibly tough to kill themselves. Um, again, kind of a similar unit to the, the Gwythi Arthand in many ways. And we also have some more marksmen over here. And then the final army that's on the defence, we have another House of Finarfin army commanded by Tundra's Fox. I'd imagine it's kind of similar over here. So yeah, more marksmen of Nargotha on the heavier Elven Archer variant. Uh, more marksmen. He's got a lot of stakes here to make sure the wargs can't charge across the river into his formations. Archers of Talath Dirnin as well, so the standard archers for Finarfin. Defenders of Talath Dirnin, swordsmen of Talath Dirnin. At the back he's got some wardens of Nargothrond, and he actually has two units of bridge wards of Nargothrond as well, instead of the Sartor Findorato. So, in a way, that could be seen as better, because two units of pikes is obviously going to be better at one at holding a choke point, but the Sartor Findorato are also not quite as vulnerable to missiles in the same way that these heavy elven pikemen are. Um, but without further ado, let us begin. So I think just through sheer numbers here, and just based on the fact that it is based upon an actual historical battle from the Middle Earth times, and based on the huge force that uh, Angband has here, I would have to say, even though it is rarely, I have to say, a 3v3 scenario where it is an attack-defense situation, I'm still going to go with the attackers here, because I do think the, uh, the sheer amount of uh, troops that Angband have available to them it's going to be difficult for Finarfin to keep up the assault, and especially considering the fact that uh, their reinforcements, essentially, their support from Feanor is mostly the human units. There's nothing wrong with that per se, a lot of javelins, potentially really good. But the shield bearers are not going to be uh, quite the uh, powerhouse in melee they would want backing them up. They do have the knights, but I do think that Angband also have the answers for the knights in this particular situation. And also, like I said, I believe that this model for the Guardians of the Iron Crown is erroneous. I don't believe this is what they're meant to look like. I believe they're meant to look like a mace-wielding variant of the Spear Guard over here, which would imply that they're actually really heavy, sort of shielded, heavily armoured, armour-piercing line infantry, as opposed to low-tier, cheap, disposable shock infantry, which uh, that look would make you believe. But regardless, it doesn't really change matters for the defenders all that much as the rain starts to fall. What have we got over here? Some stalkers of Tor in Faroth, which I believe are sort of assassin units, so they have sort of throwing weapons, as well as being dual wielders in melee, so assassins for all intents and purposes, with all the strengths and weaknesses that come with that. Be interesting to see how well they do. Of course, in terms of defensive or melee skill, they should be quite dominant against most of the orcs in melee, you would say. Really heavy rain coming down now. Rather fitting, considering the uh, scenario. The fires will soon rage, I would imagine, considering what Morgoth is all about. Yeah, I mean, the, the main thing that I think that Finarfin are going to have to try and fall back upon here, unsurprisingly, considering the shape of this battle, is going to be their, uh, it's going to be their archers. Marksmen of Nargothrond especially are going to be quite strong, of course. They do have quite a lot of javelins in the shape of the Swordsman of Talath Dianin as well, so a lot of javelins just in general for the defenders here. Is that going to be sufficient to uh, have them win? I'm going to go up to time 6 speed here, because I don't really want to make a cut, because as soon as the battle gets underway, I don't think it's going to be a particularly long cut as it is, but we'll go up to time 6 speed as the orcs amble their way through the trees, getting ready to try and cross the river into Valyrian. Some of the cavalry units are going to be leading the way as well. Uh, it is the Balrogs who are leading the way, amusingly enough. So, I mean, the Balrogs are here, and again, the Balrogs, like, looking at them, looking at how uh, intimidating they look with their wings, just the presence of them on the battlefield in general, you may make the mistake of thinking that they are sort of indestructible, that they're trolls without the downsides of trolls, but that isn't the case. Like. Trolls have always been extremely strong as long as you support them properly. You know, they're not going to be—they're not the sort of unit that's capable of just charging into a, an enemy army all on their lonesome and winning just based upon that. It will not work out for them. Troll Guard of Gothmog, much the same thing. Stronger perhaps than the trolls we're used to, but still subject to the same strengths and weaknesses. As the rain continues to fall, as the orcs continue to drag their heels and get themselves into a position to attack. Secretariat getting forming up his first line. I have to say, looking at the compositions, J Monster did look to have the most elite army. Secretariat with the uh, the lowest tier army on display today. 
That's a lot of wretches of Angband moving forward. I mean, if the elves have their way, they won't be using their ammunition on wretches of Angband. For Christ's sake, that's the second time I've done that. But now, we can, I think, start to think about the actual battle itself. And we can see here, wretches of Angband going to be moving forward. They're already tired, having charged across the field from the far edge of the map. And they're going to be the first ones in. Will they actually have any support coming forward? I mean, I'd definitely send up the uh, thralls of Angband as well, just to start poking and prodding at the elven lines with some missiles as well. Uh, because, of course, sending forward a fodder tier unit like this, especially into a really strong defence, is not going to go too well for the wretches. They're probably going to rout as soon as they arrive, so it's not even as if you're going to get treated to a, a nice fight where the orcs are just throwing themselves at the enemy lines. They'll sort of collide with the elves, fight for about 10 seconds and then think, actually we've got no support, we're going to run away. That's generally how these fights go, especially now that the wretches are very tired. Which is not great for them. The stalkers have been revealed, so the stalkers I think they were kind of hoping that they could uh, catch a higher tier unit unawares. Instead they're going to have to make do with the wretches. Uh, this should be uh, a, a very predictable one-sided fight for the Stalkers. The Wretches, of course, are by far and away the least impressive unit that Angband have, because at least the Thralls can be an annoyance, but when you commit the Wretches all on their own, Elves are easily going to be able to, uh, to deal with them in the manner that you would expect. And I'd imagine very few Elves are going to fall as well. I mean, the Wretches could try and wrap around, attack from the side as well, which I think is what Secretariat is going to try and do. If he does that, he will kill off a few more than um, he would have otherwise. Um, so, Gildor sending forward his units maybe all on their own a little bit, a little bit too heavy-handedly. He could get away, I think, by sending up a unit of defenders of Talath Dianin as well, just shifting his uh, front line forwards a little bit, at least temporarily. Uh, but I don't think he's going to get much more of a chance to do that because Artorius' army is coming forward now. A lot of Iron Shod units getting ready. So the first units just here to screen. Get everything engaged and then J Monster and Artorius will follow through with some of their stronger units. Still quite an easy job for the Stalkers. They are losing a few unit models, and most of those will probably be happening over here where they are a little bit more overwhelmed for numbers, but at the centre of things over here, the wretches are rapidly losing manpower. And this will be a good thing for the elves overall, just to try and make a dent in the sheer amount of numbers that are coming forth. Ah, here we go. Marksman of Nargothrond. You can see, of course, the Marksman, the higher tier archer for the House of Benarkin, do have access to those split shot arrows in much the same way as the Kindred of Caliborn have in Reforge. So, of course, this means they're not quite as potent as rangers when it comes to uh, their killing power. But firing into a blob, they will still get several hits, and they aren't subject to the same penalties in terms of missile damage as rangers, so each hit is uh, sort of around the 8 missile damage that you'd expect from the elves. But the Ironshot Arbalists are in position now, and they are going to be trying to fire their own missiles across, but you can see here lots of those elven arrows coming in, very eager to shut down those crossbows as well they should be. Yeah, this unit of uh, Stalkers now is going to be overwhelmed, however, as the, uh, the Iron Shod Reavers come forward. I think it's actually time for a bit of uh, slow motion. The Balrogs are coming in, although they're actually getting caught. Ooh, the Blood Spray. I always get a little bit nervous when I see that Blood Spray. More of a problem with Rangers than it has been with the Split Shot projectile, but still. Troll Guard of Gothmog, the Balrogs are coming in, so Artorius not pulling any punches here. The initial testing of the lines with fodder did not last very long, as now Angband fall upon this front line, and it's also going to be happening over on the other side as well. You can see here the wretches of Angband bunching up. The Guardians of the Iron Crown, the ultimate liars here, because I do believe um, they are heavily armoured and heavily shielded line infantry, as I said. You can see here the Archers of Talath in and opening up standard Elven Archers as opposed to the Split Shots, and they are trying to go after the Iron Shot Arbalists, who actually have got themselves into a very nice position to fire, up here on this hillside, because it means they do have a better shot than they otherwise would. Uh, but they are also a little bit more exposed to the Elven Arrows as a result. The Uraloki trying to get into position. Easier said than done, it must be said, to get the Uraloki into a position where they can actually fire. 
you don't want to send them too close because they could end up charging into the enemy ranks and then you probably end up losing them at this stage in the battle uh, which would not be great from their perspective but over here this is a massive assault forward and as a result all of the marksmen of Nargothrond are already opening up scouts of Tor in Farhoth as well starting to open up as well so sort of lighter archers with poison arrows at this stage in proceedings it's unlikely the poison arrows will have the morale impact that would cause this Angband army to break later on they might um, so poison arrows of course spears in melee as well really nice all-purpose unit uh, but it's the split shots that are going to be doing the most damage here to uh, to Angband's army. Warns of Nargothrond holding onto the front line here. Going to be going up against the Ironshot Ravagers who are charging in. Ironshot Ravagers, you know, armor-piercing shock infantry. Should be decent against these heavily armored spears. I mean, the, the level of quality is such that the elves should still comfortably win, especially considering the fact there's a lot of missiles also finding their way into the unshielded Ironshots. This is a lot of damage being done here, but it's also a lot of orcs. Javelins are coming in. Some of the Ironshot Legionaries are actually pushing their way through. Marksmen of Nargothron being caught in melee. They will, of course, be able to defend themselves rather easily against the few orcs that managed to get through this line. But they really need to keep these archers firing. Sartor Findorato moving forward, I think, here. Gildor is seeing the danger that this Angband army uh, represents. He needs to send forward more of his units. The javelins and the archers are doing a lot of damage, but his his infantry is holding on, but it, there are gaps appearing, and if the gaps start to appear, and the orcs start to get in and around your defence, that is not a good sign at all. Of course, this could end up costing Artorius as well. Like, he is putting an enormous amount of pressure on this front line. But ultimately... He could end up throwing away too much of his manpower doing this by feeding them into the uh, the meat grinder. The elves doing damage in melee and at range. Another shower of javelins coming down. The Sartor Finderato are going to try and hold this section of line here where the troll guard of Gothmog and the Balrogs still reside. The stalkers are over here as well. The Bal like One of the Balrogs has found its way in behind enemy lines. These marksmen, uh, if they still have ammunition need to start firing as quickly as they're able. You can see the multiple heads of the Uruloki over here taking a lot of damage from the poison arrows but of course these monstrous units always have a lot of HP so basic arrows take a little while before they actually uh, start making them fall. Uruloki there the fiery breath coming in. You can see it's obviously not quite as devastating as the, uh, the Witcher fire but it's still a real problem and these uh, scouts getting grilled by the Uruloki the upside to the Uraloki, of course, is that they are actually very uh, very useful in melee when all is said and done as well. A little bit inaccurate there, some of the fire, but still several of these scouts are getting grilled. I think things are going a little bit better for the defenders over here. I think Tundra's Fox's defense is holding up far better, but also a part of that is the fact that Jay Monster is not front-loaded quite so heavily as Artorius. He's going for sort of the slow burn approach, whereas Artorius is uh, going for the all or nothing. The all or nothing charge. Guardians of the Iron Crown, again. I think it's important to note that these guys, I think they should be heavy line infantry rather than light shock infantry. Um, so it's sort of a a slow burn fight rather than the uh, fast and furious one that this sort of infantry unit would normally provide us. Over here on this side, meanwhile. Secretariat still has, still has his army, of course, uh, with uh, support that he can send to either side. His wretches were just the first wave in. Oof, dear, oh dear. So many split shot arrows pointing in the same direction. I mean, it is it is pretty much everything has been committed near enough. I mean, all of the archers are firing pretty much. This, this unit of swordsmen is the only thing that hasn't really been mobilized for the defenders thus far. The scouts have run out of ammunition. Another unit of scouts is going to start to fire now. But pretty much all of Artorius' army is in. Pretty much all of Gildor's army is in. And I actually think Gildor, he has managed to hold on reasonably well. Some of the Balrogs are in behind the lines. The marksmen are trying to uh, get out of position. But his army, his main line, has managed to hold its shape, which is a bad sign for the Orcs. Like, if you go for this sort of tactic under normal circumstances, you want the line to buckle more so than it has done here. And I think this speaks quite highly of Finarfin's, the House of Finarfin's strengths. Like, heavy spearmen focus pole arms, not necessarily the fastest at killing, but at holding a line 
of all the Elven factions in the game at the moment, Finarfin should probably be doing the best at that. Feanor also have their own brand of that with line infantry, but they're a little bit more geared towards dealing damage whilst they do that. Finarfin, while in formation, holding the line, should be a little bit better off. But I think actually the slow burn approach that Jay Monster has taken, Secretariat sending forward also some assistance, um, appears to be having the desired effect so far. Scouts of Tor in Faroth. Also being committed now, two-handed spears in melee, out of ammunition. Covering the holes and gaps that were appearing in this front line. So far, so good for the elves. They've managed to hold on. And keeping organisation is always going to be the key here. More fiery breath coming in from the Uraloki again. More of them falling away. The scouts really trying to bring down the Uraloki. One of them has fallen, interestingly enough. This is the only one that's left, and he's taking a lot of arrows, to be fair. There's a lot of poison arrows coming in as well. A bit of friendly fire, but mostly hitting the right targets. But there's plenty more where that came from. And the Spear Guard of the Iron Crown will be able to withstand ranged punishment a lot better with their heavy armor and their big shields. Guardians of the Iron Crown, like I said, should be that way inclined as well. Angband in general are pretty good at that sort of thing. Meanwhile, more damage being done to the Iron Shot Arbalists. I think definitely the right thing to do now. I think a lot of damage has been done to the... Ooh. This, however, is not good. The line has been buckled. So it's taken a little while, but Artorius, having taken a real beating at the hands of the Elven Archers, finally has his gap, and he needs to flood forwards now. But the problem is, I don't think he actually has an anything left in reserve to flood forward with. I think Secretariat is going to be the need to be the one to do that. A couple of units of Iron Shod Legionaries moving in now, but... The problem is, no reinforcements were immediately on hand to take advantage of the gap as it appeared. And as a result, Gildor is going to be able to shut that door once again. A unit of Marksmen of Nargothron shoring up the line, not allowing them through. Heavy Elven Archers getting into melee there. In close quarters with the Iron Shod Ravagers, they're going to be victorious there with those Elven Curve Blades. Another unit of Marksman of Nargothrond. Of course, the upshot of this is, for the Orcs, is that there's only one unit of Marksman of Nargothrond which is still firing, which means Gildor has used up most of his ammunition, but he's used up most of his ammunition to devastatingly good effect, I think. Poison Arrow is still coming in from the side as well, so... It does speak quite well, I think, of Angband that they haven't mass-routed, considering the amount of punishment they've taken, and considering the Poison Arrows feeding in to uh, the uh, morale shocks as well. Guardians of the Iron Crown, you can see now bridge wards of Nargothrond have been moved forward, much as they have been on the other side for some time, of course, with everything being committed forward. But pikes on the front line. Do Angband have the capacity to take them out? Do they still have... J Monster still has another unit of Uraloki in reserve, I believe. Or at least he should, unless they were committed forward as well. Are they all dead? No, surely not. Maybe they are. Maybe they did all die. There's one dead Uraloki over here, but I could have sworn he only committed forward one unit. Uraloki are not the sort of thing to die quickly to archers, so I can't believe I would have missed such a thing. Poison arrows coming in from the side, though. This assault is still ongoing, but I actually think as well, the elves over on this side will be quite happy with this, because their pikes in a slow burn fight like this are going to be very, very effective. Forward come the archers of Talatin and the scouts, so archers that are out of ammunition being committed to the front now to try and make sure that the orcs stay at arm's length. Marksman of Nargothrond over there. More split shots coming in now, this time from Tundra's Fox. Shooting right along this orc line. Arrows coming from across the way. Thralls of Angband doing their best. And to be fair, they are slowly but surely peeling away at the scouts, but... I can't help but feel... Oh, no, Tundra's Fox does have some Sartor Findorato, so I was lying. He did actually have a unit hidden away. So a high-tier unit of spears still ready to be committed, and so far, I think the defenders have actually had a pretty good, uh, pretty good time of it because the Orcs have not been able to punch through these lines, and of course there's still the small matter of the reinforcements. Like, this could be the hammer blow that could finish the Orcs off. All of these human units, including javelins, archers, spearmen, and then there is, of course, the Roqueni Magloro as well. That unit of knights could be a devastating hammer blow to the Orcs. They really do need to make something happen here. But it's easier said than done. Like, I think Artorius has... Uh, has shot his bolt, so to speak. He's already made his play and it failed. 
House of Finarfin was able to withstand the onslaught admirably, I have to say. And Secretariat has had to pick up the slack, but just a couple of units of Iron Shod Reavers are not going to be sufficient in this fight, I don't think, to, uh, to win them the day, unfortunately for them. There's still the immovable Finarfin line continues to hold on. There are still reinforcements to be committed though, including Bulldogs. A couple of Wolf Riders getting ready for the inevitable cavalry onslaught with some wretches as well. Some Sartor Finderato maybe getting a little bit too big for their boots. A little bit greedy as they charge forward all alone into the advancing reinforcements. A couple of units of Iron Shot Reavers, but I think this is all Secretariat has left to commit. And I don't think this is going to bother Gildor all that much. He still has a unit of Marksmen that he can commit to melee as well. It's all Secretariat can do though, like they need to keep this assault going, otherwise Gildor is going to have units potentially to counterattack across the river and join in with the Feanor reinforcements as they arrive, which would not be good for the Orcs at all. Over here though, this does mean that the clock is ticking and the Orcs will need to uh, move forward. Axes and sword blows raining down upon the Finarfin lines, but still over here as well. Finarfin doing well, once again they're trying to push through the lines, like this time they need to make it stick I think. As soon as these spear guard make a hole, like they're going to need to send in the reavers, they're going to need to send in elite units, I think, to try and make this stick. And again, Tundra's Fox, he's got another unit on hand, the bridge wards of Nargothrond. I think that is pretty much it for Tundra's Fox now as well, aside from archers. So, uh, much like on the other side, Tundra's Fox has had to go all in to stop the orc assault, but the Finarfin lines have been so solid so far in this battle. And the spear guard of the Iron Crown Knight had the right idea here, Jaymon, so he was trying to make a hole within the line clearly and then sort of follow through with infantry, but again it failed. Again that will have cost him manpower. And I don't think the Orcs have got too many pushes like that left in them. Morgoth, I think, is... It's looking ever more like Morgoth is going to leave this battlefield disappointed. The Halberdiers are going to do very well, though. They're actually in a section of line where the pikes aren't which means that armor-piercing phalanx of theirs is going to be really useful at equalizing the fight against something as strong as the Sartor Finderato. More halberdiers and legionaries over here, although I do believe there are some pikemen over here as well. Yeah, bridge wards of Nargothrond, which of course will be the ideal counter to a push from the Ironshot halberdiers, backed up by the spear guard of the Iron Crown. There's a lot of orcs still over here, and there isn't really much in the way of ranged options now for the defenders. I think this unit of marks from Nargothrond might be the only one on this side of the river that still has ammunition. Admittedly it's in a perfect place to exploit the Angband lines at this stage and of course he's going to be able to pad out his kill count ever more so Tundra's Fox but that is the hope I think here for the Orcs. I mean what sort of reinforcements do they have? Arbalists? Reavers? I have to say I don't think the Arbalists have been able to get good shots off because they really haven't been able to make an impact on the defensive lines. Like you'd expect if they had crossbows like that to have been uh, devastatingly powerful. Meanwhile, what is going on over here? Are they trying to push through with uh, with wolf riders? Wait. What happened there? Was that the Sartor Finderato? Or was that Secretariat's general? I mean, either way, if it was Secretariat's general, the Sartor Finderato have really, uh, really punched above their weight there. More reinforcements. I mean, the Ironshod Reavers have had an impact here on this line. The Marshal of Nargothrond, at this point, Gildor maybe took his eye off the ball a little bit here, and his line has sort of lost its shape a little bit. He should still be fine based upon the quality of troops he has left and based on the fact Secretariat doesn't have much left in the tank, I don't think. Marks of Nargothrond coming forward, he still has some scouts back there as well, which he can commit to melee. But this has become a little bit messier for Gildor's Finarfin army than it needed to. Well played from Secretariat to make the best of a bad situation over here. But, as we say that, just as Secretariat starts to maybe have an impact, like getting these wolf riders across the, the river, that maybe should have been the sort of thing he was ready to do sooner. He is going to try and push in. He needs to do it quickly as well because now Stoop and the army from the House of Feanor are moving forward. And this could be where the Orcs start to lose out. I mean, you know, these wolf riders are trying to get through. Like, there was the opportunity to do that sooner. 
As much as I was just praising Secretariat, he could have been quicker on the draw there. Stalkers? Where did they come from? There's not another river crossing over there. They were just waiting, biding their time, hidden away, ready to come in from the sides. And now, of course, the Orcs have got not only Feanor, but they've got this flanking unit as well. Iron Shot Reavers, so now they can't just focus on the front lines. And to be fair, they need to just focus on the front lines if they're going to get through here, because still, still the elves hold on. But now, they're going to have to deal with the crimson clad knights from the House of Feanor as well. Dangerously close to pink, that colour scheme, I have to say. I'm not sure whether that makes them scarier. I mean, the thralls of Angband are going to try and get in the way here. I mean, they can get in the way, and that is preferable, but they're going to get obliterated off the charge against uh, the knights here. A nasty charge there coming in from Feanor. Huge amount of damage done there to the thralls of Angband, as you'd expect. These thralls, I think they were coming in to try and take advantage of the gaps that were appearing. What happened to the wolf riders? They don't tell me they all die. Did they all die? Or are they over here? No, they must have all died, which is uh, disappointing to say the least. Oof, another charge coming in. Again on the thralls of Angband. Going after the low hanging fruit here, but why not? At this point, the reinforcements from Feanor could just be the cherry on the cake here, as the wretches of Angband are in full retreat as the. Uh, the Huntsmen of Thargallion start to uh, bombard the troops that are over here, and they're going to have to retreat. I think this front line over here, at this point you have to say it's a bit of a lost cause. It's a shame, actually, because Secretariat was finally making progress, even if it was with lower tier units. If those Wolf Riders had found their way around quicker, they could have made something happen over here, but with the arrival of the Feanor units, that isn't going to happen anymore. As we do enter the final phases, the Orcs are going to have to concentrate their forces at this point and hope that that will be sufficient more spear guard of the iron crown moving forward i mean the orcs are still relatively strong over on this front line evenly matched the iron shot legionnaires facing off against the march of nargothrond and i think those are sartor finderato on the front line still but is that going to be sufficient i'm not sure it is these assassins making a nuisance of themselves. The Reavers and the out-of-ammunition Arbalists should be enough to finish them off, to be fair, but they're just getting in the way of things. Tundra's Fox making it awkward for the Orcs still, buying time for the House of Feanor to be that hammer blow that they want. Wretches of Angban. And they're going to probably form up a defensive line over here as the Roqueni move forwards. Wolf Riders of Angband are over here as the Thralls move backwards, the Wretches, they're going to try and defend their front line, as well they should, because I mean a, a hammer and anvil strike from the Knights into the back of the uh, Angband front line over there would probably be game, set and match to the defenders. But the Wolf Riders do catch up with them, and that's not ideal for the Knights, they don't really want to be in melee with the Wolf Riders, especially not with the Wretches on the way over here, they may be extremely low tier by comparison, but they're still Spearman, combined with those uh, Wolf Riders be a problem. And yeah, the Roqueni do take losses. The Wolf Riders did take more, to be fair. Or did they? Relatively even, actually. The Roqueni here are going to get... I think they're going to try and get a charge on those Iron Shot Reavers. But actually, the Roqueni find themselves a little bit isolated, getting a little bit far ahead of themselves, I think. Yeah, they do. They turn around and they take a downhill charge from the Wolf Riders, as well as a downhill charge from the Wretches. And this could be the end of the Roqueni, actually. Uh, they are going to wriggle away, but they're going to take more losses more unnecessary losses and more wretches are coming in so yeah too far ahead of themselves there I think over here though the shield bearers of Halivorn coming across they're going to be able to finally finish off this assault over here it didn't go the way Artorius wanted it to with his full blooded assault over here the elves were able to hold on and the reinforcements from Secretariat did their best but ultimately still defeated as Feanor's main army comes forward and I think even if they do lose the knights to be honest with you, which it does look as though they are going to caught over here, they did get some kind of rear charge on the back line but it wasn't all that effective to be honest with you they are going to lose the knights but 
one of the biggest problems here is the fact that they're going to be taking shots in the back now from javelin men and from archers. And there goes another general. And the only thing they have that can really respond to this <coughs> are going to be the wretches. I mean, to be fair, the shield bearers of Halivorn are not quite the all-conquering force that the wretches were thrown into at the start of the battle, but they're still by far the superior unit, so the reinforcements should still be able to do their job here. Yet another general falls. Arrows finding their mark. I mean, to be fair, actually, the orcs have actually managed, over time, to defeat Tundra's, Fox's defensive line to an extent. He's still just about holding on, but without reinforcements arriving, he would have gone on to lose this fight. Thralls of Angband are fighting. Still the Rogue 20 over there. They took a real beating. Not sure where these shield bearers of Hellevorn are going. Are they going to try and get in behind and sort of reinforce the line from the front? Kind of sloppy play that from Stoop. He's overshot his mark by miles, regardless of what he was trying to do. Over here, more shield bearers. Stalkers of Thargallion who are going to try and use their javelins, but they were engaged in melee by the wretches. Again, it's been kind of a sloppy kind of sloppy play from Feanor. Like, they could have organised a little bit better, but I don't really recognise the name, so possibly a newer player. The Huntsmen are still doing their job, though. Range support is going to be important here. Doesn't matter if Angband are reasonably good at taking damage like this. It's still support that they are not able to supply their own troops with. Shield Bearers of Halivorn, they did go right around to try and reinforce the front line. Wretches of Angband, Balancer forces evenly matched against the Stalkers of Thargelion. Of course, far outnumber the Stalkers, and the Stalkers, first and foremost, are Javelin men, so not too surprising. But at this point, I mean, the Rogue Quenny, with how they were wasted, the Wolf Riders now actually do have... You know, the, at the attackers have Cav superiority here. They could keep charging in and out. They're trying to go after the Rangers of Halivorn, which, of course, are really, really dangerous Javelin men, so... Trying to cycle charging and out of them. Not too surprising that they are the target. Shield bearers coming across from over here as well. The reinforcements. Not a lot left, I have to say, of Gildor's army. He has some swordsmen of Talath Theoden. But that's just about it. They need to get in there. They need to muck in and help out. They can't afford to just hover on the periphery of the battle. They may have done a lot in this battle already, but it's going to be all hands to the pump here. If they don't, then there's still a chance that Angband could claw out a victory here. Wretched of Angband victory, almost a certainty, especially with the Spear Guard here, so they're going to be able to destroy the Storks of Dark Alien here. And for how much damage the Orcs have taken throughout this entire fight, the fact that they are still in with a chance of winning here. Bulldogs on the front line as well, I mean, this is fairly key, to be honest with you, because at this point... The Elves, Finarfin, have dumped so much into their front line that they're not going to have the strength left to withstand the Bulldogs in melee with or without the additional support they're getting from the Shield Bearers of Halivorn. Basic spears only, they are. Iron Shod Reavers. Uh, Wolf Riders taking a bit of damage. Jamos needs to keep them moving. If he can keep them charging in and out of the right targets, but they're really getting focused down at this point, which is going to be a real problem for the Orcs. More shield bearers arriving onto the front line to reinforce. There's a lot of thralls, there's a lot of wretches to poke and prod their way through. Swords from Talath did in. Another nice javelin volley coming in from the rangers there. Spear guard of the Iron Crown taking a lot of damage from javelins and from arrows. A very resilient unit, but... Especially against the javelin man, they're going to suffer with the final arrival of the Finarfin reinforcements from Gildor. That could be just what the defenders needed to tip their chances at winning this battle over the edge. Still a lot of these wretches that the House of Feanor are having to clear up, but ain't the most glamorous opponent to kill off, but someone's got to do it. The Javelins finally starting to finish off the Wolf Riders, charging in there to the Stalkers, and finally the final Wolf Rider falls all of these wretches still getting in the way of the main body of the Feanor reinforcements, but by how much are Angband going to win over here? 
I mean, they are going to win. Then Arfin are going to really make them work for it, though. And by the time all is said and done, will they have enough left from over here to meet the Feanor onslaught? Time will tell. Shield bearers of Hellevorn over here. They're actually turning around at this point, the Iron Shod Reavers, trying to go across to meet Feanor's advance. I think the key here is if the attackers are going to win this still, they're going to be reliant on the sheer might of a unit like the Bulldogs to carry them over the line at this point. But I'm not sure even the Bulldogs or the Spear Guard of the Iron Crown, such as they are, are going to be enough to, uh, to drag them over the line. An interesting duel here on the riverbank between an Iron Shard Reaver and a Marksman of Nargothrond. Of the two, you back the Marksman. A two-handed weapon. Elven skill and training. Up against just an angry orc who's had as much metal strapped to him as possible. He's giving as good as he gets, though. Keep, if he keeps attacking like this and the marksman can't parry then he has every chance of winning here. Can he beat the odds? He parries. Lands a hit. Gets parried. Ooh, that's going to be the end. Yeah, the marksman ends up winning but a brave effort there from that one reaver. Meanwhile, the shield bearers of Halivorn now being faced with a more genuine threat in the Iron Shod Reavers. Bearers of Halibor moving forward. Wretches of Angban victory seems certain for them back here. I mean, the Orcs. Carving out victories for themselves across the field. And the Shield Bearers here, the problem the Shield Bearers have is they're just not a damaging infantry unit. Like, they're pretty good at holding. But at this point, I think what the defenders need is the ability to carve their way through opponents. And I actually think the Orcs, they may be about to turn this fight around. I mean, forward comes the Spear Guard of the Iron Crown. The Bulldogs are here. 38 Bulldogs. And the Wretches, I mean, they're going to lose in the background there, but forward come the Shield Bearers. Could it be that the waste of the Knights from the House of Feanor could be vital in this battle? And J-Monster and Secretariat have rationed their forces well here. And they're still in with a real shot at winning here. The Spear Guard of the Iron Crown, though, they are outnumbered by the Shield Bearers here. And with a little bit of reinforcement from the Marksman of Nargothron, that could be vital again. But it's this unit that I'm worried about from a, from a defending point of view. Do they have what it takes to defeat the Bulldogs? I mean, they do, but they need to overwhelm them with numbers. And as long as... The rest of the Angband army continues to stand and fight. Maybe the Orcs can pull out an unlikely victory here. In come the Marksmen with a rear charge. That's not going to be great for the, the Angband Orcs. The Bulldogs are going to need to uh, decide what to do pretty quickly. I think they're going to need to charge into the rear of this line as well. Turn it into a messy fight. And hope that that's enough, because if the defenders can keep organised and overwhelm the attackers in pockets, that's going to be bad. There's also the fact that these Storks of Thargallion have finally got free. Ten Javelin men firing their payload into Rangers of Halivorn trying to get out of uh, harm's way here. 91 wretches, 37. Storks of Thargallion, what are they going to do? Probably need to focus on the Bulldogs, to be honest with you. Try and finish them off. All of the elves at this point, most of the elves anyway, are dead. And it's going to be left to the men to try and pull out the victory here. Rangers of Halivorn turning around to meet the advance of the Bulldogs. I think the problem the Bulldogs may have is they may not have enough support to claw the victory out. The Rangers of Halivorn are trying to get away from the wretches. There's also six Sartor Finderato. Again, that's the sort of thing which could be vital as we enter the final phases of this battle. A really close one, though. Early on, the punishment the defenders were meeting out looked like they were going to win with a decent margin. But overall, the Orcs, Angband, of course, with their focuses on heavy armour, survivability, monstrous units, 
were able to withstand that storm and carve out a chance for themselves in this battle. But ultimately, I think how well the Finarfin lines were able to stand up to punishment may prove to be the difference here between uh, victory and defeat for both sides. And you can see here the wretches, what's left of the Ironshod Reavers, being overwhelmed by the shield bearers of Halivorn and the rangers of Halivorn. The hexagonal shields. The mixture of Rudawa and Rohirrim styles. Not hard to see where the Northman came from when you see this. Oh yeah, Bulldog's taking some uh, some hits in the back there. Stalkers of Thargallion getting into a good position to throw their jabbies, and I think here the Bulldogs, the last great hope of the Orcs. Taking javelins in the back, getting overwhelmed with numbers from the front. I think that's going to be that. Still the small matter of the Sartor Findorato as well. What are they going after? One wretch of Angband easy task for them to kill. The Rangers of Halivorn fighting evenly with a horde of wretches. This isn't really going to help or hinder either side, ultimately. Stalkers. Yeah, victory seems certain. And I think here the defenders are going to win. It was close, though. Very close. And ultimately, the elves, there's not many of them left standing. There's not many men left standing either in the grand scheme of things. And Morgoth, while I'm sure he will be exceedingly disappointed that he wasn't able to break into Beleriand on this occasion, he's got more lives to burn than those defending it. That much is in little doubt. Bulldogs victory seems certain. You can see how strong the Bulldogs are in melee. Especially when they're facing off against more defensively minded spearmen. The fact that they're still carving their way through. It's still the small matter of the marksman of Nargothrond and Sartor Findorato that uh, the Finarfin army still have. Going over here to try and help deal with this uh, army of wretches. There goes the final attacking general. And that may be... That may be that. Storks of Thargallion out of ammunition. Finally completing the surround on the Bulldogs. Not the best in melee, the Stalkers, but doesn't really matter at this point. Everyone charging in. Actually getting some kills on the charge as well. Still some bridge wards in the background as well. Definitely doing their job on the front line. Again, it was, these are very workman-like units from Feanor, like all the human units. The Javelins are damaging, yes, but the shield bearers are just a sort of standard spearman unit. Good for holding. Not too expensive. But that was enough, ultimately. Normally what Feanor are all about are heavy cavalry and heavy line infantry. Elven heavy line infantry. Uh, but on this occasion, it was just their more standard units that we saw as a reinforcement column. The real stars of the show here, I have to say, were the House of Finarfin. Their heavy spearmen were very, very impressive on this occasion. Like Their ability to hold a line here, I think, is very well very well shown. I think actually Angband, they, what they're all about was shown off pretty well as well. Because most Orc factions that we're used to seeing, I think would have wilted in the face of that uh, arrow storm and defense, and their morale would have fallen apart. Angband, however, are made of sterner stuff. And I think that's why this battle ended up being as close as it was in the end. Because they were able to withstand that punishment. And there go the wretches. Victory for the defenders. 5,000 kills for one of the uh, Finarfin armies, which I'd imagine uh, was the one facing off against Artorius. Because Artorius' all-in approach didn't really work out all that well. Um, in the end, it was Jay Monster's slow but sure approach, which did end up bearing more fruit in the end. Secretariat obviously was playing support for both of them, um, so he had to sort of react based upon that. Captain Gothmog heading things up, um, unfortunately for him, uh, falling here. Uh, so unlike the uh, how the battle went in law, um, the Dagol Bragolak on this occasion has actually gone in favour of the defenders, but like I said, uh, more Goth probably has. Far more where that came from after breaking the Siege of Angband and... Uh, Next time he'll be sure to send uh, men and, well, I say men, orcs and beasts that won't disappoint him in this way. Uh, but yeah, well played from the defenders, I have to say. Again, I think the stars of the show were the House of Finarfin because of their ability to hold the line. I think we did see Angband, though, and their strengths documented quite well here. 
Feyenoord, under normal circumstances, that's not the sort of thing you'd see from Feyenoord. Like, you'd see sort of a bigger focus on their heavy cavalry units and a bigger focus on sort of their heavy high-tier infantry unit. The units we saw here are more their supporting cast. Uh, normally, the uh, the humans are there to sort of act as a foil to the elves in the uh, in the Feyenoord army, but in this particular scenario, um, the, the humans and the uh, the unit of knights were just meant to be the, uh, the reinforcement column. Um, so I'm sure we'll see more of Feyenoord in the future. Let's see what did the damage for the Orcish factions, however. So up here we can see um, the army from Secretariat, not Secretariat, sorry, um, Artorias, in the end proving to be probably the disappointment of the uh, of the battle because he went all in, didn't really work out all that well for him. His his units like the Balrogs and the Troll Guard not getting anywhere near enough kills considering the amount of damage they can do. Um, really the thing that didn't let him down at least was the Arbalist because he was able to get them into a decent position. Obviously it's very difficult to... Uh, to see crossbow bolts and how effective they're being, but they did break 200 kills. So ultimately the damage that his crossbows did, did allow Secretariat to gain a bit of a foothold on that side. But by the time they did, of course, that was when the Feanor reinforcements were on their way across. And at that point they had to sort of retreat over to try and put all their eggs into one basket over on the other side. <coughs> Down here, this I believe was Secretariat's army because um, there's a lot of wretches. Um, which were sent in initially, of course, getting more kills perhaps than they had any right to. But Secretariat acting as a supporting army, not likely to get as many kills. Uh, but one unit of Ironshot Halberdiers are able to avoid the uh, bridge wards of Nargothrond uh, and able to break 250 kills as a result. So it does go to show um, that with less Phalanx units on display, you do need to use them effectively because the, the differing fortunes here of these two units is clear to see. One was used brilliantly, the other one... Uh, clearly was able to have its formation broken, perhaps it was up against the bridge wards, that sort of thing. And then down here, Captain Muzzbug, aka J Monster, his bulldogs did brilliantly. I mean, they were committed when all of the missiles had effectively dried up, um, so they were just purely a melee, uh, sort of purely in melee, um, and as a result they were able to break 400 kills. A lot of that will have been on sort of more basic units, out of ammunition archers, from Finarfin and of course stuff like the shield bearers of Halivorn from the House of Feanor. But even so, it's always very impressive when a unit of melee infantry manages to break 400 kills like that. The Uraloki may be a little bit disappointing, not able to get um, the kind of kills that maybe J Monster would have wanted. Part of that I think was the fact that they were focused down. Like A lot of arrows were dumped into the Uraloki and as a result actually, um, the ammunition supply was dried up for the Bulldog. So I mean it's kind of a trade-off here but even so, with the Uraloki, you'd be hoping to get more kills than that, I think. Iron Shod units, I mean, J-Monster's army was the one to do better. I mean, some of these units did worse, but that was because they were the ones committed first, of course. Stuff like the Uraloki in the first wave. As time wore on, though, J-Monster and the supporting units that Secretariat sent forward for him did sort of were able to gain the, uh, the upper hand, and that is to their credit, I have to say. Very, very well done. But ultimately, it wasn't enough because the initial damage that uh, was inflicted how long Finarfin was able to hold that line for Feanor to come and assist them was also very key. And in the end, I think a well-earned victory for the defenders here. Um, so yeah, that was another look at Silmarillion Total War. It's been a little while, but of course I want to show Silmarillion um, as and when uh, the developers for it want me to, uh, because it obviously shows it off in uh, the best possible light. Um, and I think with uh, some progress being made now, I think there's going to be a little bit more of Silmarillion to come in the following weeks. Obviously with everyone uh, having, most people anyway, having a little bit more free time on their hands, I suppose that means that uh, development is going to lurch forward a little bit more than it otherwise would for both Reforged and for Silmarillion. Um, but, even so, um, it's good to see. Um, and hopefully I can be a part of some of these now, because I think a couple of uh, other scenarios have been made, and hopefully I can be a part of them. And hopefully I can show them off in this fashion as well. Um, so it's always good to see. And also, it's worth saying as well, um, before I move on, um, I think this was Belagost who made this scenario. Possibly? I think it was either Belagost or Secretariat, but I'm not sure which one it was. Regardless, um, my bad for that. Whoever did make this scenario obviously deserves full credit for that. Um, it is on the Anduin map, so the map itself wasn't made completely from scratch, but even so, scenarios do still take a bit of forethought and effort to make regardless. Um, and yeah, obviously uh, next up, probably going to be um, a, a return to Reforged because I do have another battle which I do want to get right on with as soon as possible, if I can help it. Um, 
there's also the matter of Bannerlord. I mean, Bannerlord, like I said, like long form content in the form of a campaign only really works if you're a really sort of highly established YouTuber. Um, the first one or two episodes may very well have uh, garnered some attention. Um, but as the campaign wore on, I think interest would have dropped off quite rapidly. It's the same with a Total War campaign. Like, it's one of those things where, yeah, I could do it, but YouTube doesn't really reward long-form content like that. That's more the sort of thing you have to stream for. And like I said, I don't really know what I'm doing when it comes to streaming. Um, so that's a possibility for the future. But um, there is going to be Bannerlord content. Um, in some form. I do have an idea of what I want to do, um, but I also need to um, get a little bit more experience and a little bit more uh, a little bit more of an understanding of the game um, before I'm able to do what I want to do with Bannerlord. Um, but, uh, regardless, that is the sort of thing which will probably be coming in the next week or so, uh, but obviously in the interim, the, uh, the regular stream of Reforged and possibly some Silmarillion content will continue. Uh, so, yeah. I hope you enjoyed this, and I hope you will join me for whatever is next.